Welcome back to the home lab on this very wet and blustery day outside. So I've got a really interesting experiment to show you today and I'm going to hark back to the videos I used to make a while ago where I show you an experiment and then after that I explain it. So get your tin hats ready. What we're going to look at is the Faraday cage. So just before we start, I wanted to say a massive and really heartfelt thanks to you all for supporting my channel and watching these videos. We actually reached 6,000 subscribers this week, something that I thought would never happen. And uh, many years ago when I started, I made myself a little 1,000 subscribers plaque uh, because I thought I'd never get one from YouTube. But the channel is growing and what I've done over the years is I've written on the back um, every thousand increase that I've had. So there we go. 6,000 on the 19th of February 2024, which would not have been possible without your help and support. I also want to say a great thanks too to PCBWay, my sponsors, who constantly get in touch and say, come on, make some more interesting content. And that also helps me keep going. Uh, they do a fantastic service, as you know, making bespoke printed circuit boards and doing CNC machining and all sorts of things that the maker can use. Anyway, do go and have a look at their website because there's lots of ideas for projects there and I'm sure you'll see something that interests you. So let's begin with a little bit of a story. Now, a few years ago, I went on a canal barge holiday and um, I noticed immediately that when I was inside the barge, my mobile phone just didn't work at all. But outside on the deck when we were steering it, it worked perfectly. So there was plenty of signal around, but once we were inside, I didn't get any signal at all. And of course, that's because the barge was made out of steel plate and I was inside a steel cage. Um, you might have noticed this too when you go on the ferry. Um, you can be in the harbour and you get in your cabin and your phone just stops working. If it still works, they've probably got some kind of repeater system on the ferry um, that helps get the signal from your cabin outside and they probably charge you a good amount for that. I've also noticed recently there's been a real interest and sort of surge in these sorts of things. So these wallets um, that have a sort of metallized material inside them and they're advertised as something to put your phone in and your credit cards and things so other people can't go past and skim the data off them. In other words, electromagnetic radiation can't get in and can't get out. So what we're going to look at is how the Faraday cage works. Right, let's do some experiments with our Faraday cage now. So I've got a mobile phone here. I know it's a really ancient one, but I don't want to play with my uh, more modern one. And it has the huge advantage that it's using the mobile phone network, um, not uh, local Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. So it's got to go right out to the base station and back again. So let's take the house phone. I'll put it uh, fairly near to my um, microphone so we can dial. And let's send that. OK, and I'll just hang up. So not a very exciting experiment, that one. You all know a mobile phone works. But now let's put the small mobile phone inside the Faraday cage. So let's open up the Faraday cage and the phone is on. Yep, it's on. And put that in there. The screensaver might come on, so the screen might go dark. Put the lid on and let's do a uh, redial. So here's the redial happening. And let's send that. And absolutely nothing. Nothing at all. Welcome to the O2 messaging service. The person you are calling is unable to take your call. Please leave your message after the tone. So I'm unable to uh, take the call because my phone is stuck in a Faraday cage. So let's now try the phone bag and see if it's worth all the money. Well, actually, they're not that expensive. So uh, there goes the homemade Faraday cage and in it goes. And I think it has to go inside this metalized bit. So there we go. And let's uh, dial it up. Welcome to the O2 messaging service. The person you 
So that seems to work really well. It's gone straight to the messaging service. So we've got one more thing to try, the biscuit Faraday cage. So now for the rather tastier option. So out comes the phone, still on, and out come the lovely biscuits. They smell absolutely delicious. Chuck those over there. In goes the phone into the biscuit box and let's quickly dial it up and see what happens. Welcome to the O2 messaging service. The person you are calling is unable to... Well, that worked again. So all you need is a metallized biscuit uh, container and that works as a perfectly good Faraday cage. So let me attempt a fairly simple explanation of how the Faraday cage works. Well, the first thing you need to know is uh, the Faraday screen is a bit more like the barge that I was in on holiday. That's a metal box that's sort of completely sealed. I know there's the odd door hole or what have you, but you don't have a sort of mesh that you can see through. Whereas the Faraday cage, which works in a very similar way and is used for the same sorts of things, um, is made of mesh which would make you think that electromagnetic radiation could get through the holes. But the important thing is you need to make the gaps in the holes smaller than the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation. Now, the next thing is, if you can imagine an electromagnetic wave trying to get in, because that's the easiest way to think about this, as the electromagnetic wave approaches um, the Faraday cage, um, you've got an oscillating electric field. And imagine it going past the cage. That's the easiest way to think about it. If the positive part hits this front of the cage uh, and the wave goes past, this end might have the negative part of the wave by it. Even if that's not the case, in other words, the length isn't quite right for it to be uh, a wavelength, etc. You can imagine the positive vector of the electric field hitting the front of the cage. Now, here's the clever bit. If that makes the area near the front of the cage positive for a very brief amount of time, and the crucial thing is that the cage material or the screen material is conducting, then it will drag electrons, electrons are negative, and attract them to that area. So this is positive due to the electromagnetic wave's electric vector, but the front becomes negative because the positive end has attracted the electrons from the metal in the cage to this face. So now you've got a region that's positive and negative at the same time, so those charges cancel out, so the effect of the electromagnetic wave is not to penetrate the cage. Now, there's one other way these work, and that's the Faraday cage or the Faraday screen that is connected via a wire, a good conducting wire, to ground. So uh, that's, a, in some ways, a little bit easier to explain, that as the electromagnetic wave comes along and the electric vectors going plus, minus, plus, minus, oscillating up and down, the cage itself is always held at ground potential. So it's a sort of equipotential surface all the way around. In other words, it's at zero. So never mind how much the electromagnetic wave comes past and oscillates with an electric field, the cage itself is always held at ground potential, so the wave can't cause any oscillations inside. So the items inside the cage are completely screened from the external electromagnetic radiation. Just before I finish on the explanation, um, you might think, well, what about the other way around? What if we put items in there that are radiating electromagnetic radiation? Well, an easy way to think about it is the same way. The electric vector comes, tries to come out of the Faraday cage. It creates maybe a place that's positive, close to the wall. Electrons are dragged around the conducting material to that place, which are negative, cancel the positive effect, so there's no net electric effect at that wall, so the wave can't get out of the Faraday cage, so the electromagnetic radiation is contained inside, so the items inside are completely screened from the outside and vice versa. So what are the uses of the Faraday cage? Well, um, there are a whole range of them, and some of them are in everyday use, and some of them are used in uh, scientific laboratories. One you might have seen is the incredibly huge Van de Graaff generators, with people sitting quite close to them on stools, and they're inside a little bit of a cage like this, a bit bigger than this one, and the sparks are hitting the cage, 
but they are not getting electrocuted. Now I bet you that's a Faraday cage that's connected to ground, so the surface of the cage is all at zero volts, so it cannot increase the voltage in there, so the spark that flies from the Van de Graaff generator just goes straight through the cage and down to ground. Uh, granted that's a sort of strike of lightning rather than a direct electromagnetic wave. Um, there are lots of other uses, um, screening really sensitive electronics. So if you've got electronics that could get damaged or interfered with by electromagnetic radiation, then you're going to build it inside a box, a Faraday screen, and you're just going to have holes in the side with the cables coming out. And even those cables are probably covered in some screening or copper braid material to stop electromagnetic radiation getting in and interfering with the signal. Um, another one that's really common and quite unusual um, and caused a lot of sort of fear incorrectly when I was quite young is the microwave oven door. So the microwave oven, you've got a sort of uh, metal uh, screen at the back, but at the front you kind of want to see what's going on. So there's a light inside, but if you look at the door, it's actually got a metal plate in it with lots of holes drilled in it. And that has the effect of keeping the microwave radiation inside the microwave oven. And gosh, the talk of microwaves getting out and injuring people and things, and when the door was open when I was a kid um, was absolutely rife. But uh, it was all completely wrong. The microwave ovens were very safe. And you'll notice that they switch off when you open the door. But there's one uh, use of the Faraday cage that is incredible and it's really massive. And it's that one I want to talk about next. So I said I was going to mention really large Faraday cages and I forgot about one of an intermediate size. Now I have absolutely no experience of this at all. Uh, maybe in the comments you can tell me the truth of what I'm saying. But I'm told that in embassies they have rooms that are Faraday cages. Um, they perhaps don't look like this, like um, universities do have rooms that look like this where they do research in. I guess that in an embassy uh, they have the screening of the Faraday cage buried in the walls. But the idea is they can put inside their electronics, computer systems, etc., that run the risk of emitting electromagnetic radiation that could be picked up by spies from another country. So what they do is they go into those rooms and all the electronics that they have and heaven knows what else is screened from the outside world so that what they can do is in complete secrecy without anyone else trying to pick up what they're up to. So to the really big Faraday cage, and this is one I do have experience of. Um, it's really interesting that in Germany, in Saarland, near Heusweiler, there used to be a very, very powerful radio transmitter. I think it was about 600 kilowatts, so that's a massive amount of radiated energy. And they were really worried about the electromagnetic compatibility, the EMC, uh, of the radio waves hitting cars on the A8 that were driving near there. So what they decided to do, and it's really unusual, I've not seen it anywhere else at all, is to screen the cars that were driving on the motorway past the radio transmitter from its transmissions by putting a Faraday cage up over the motorway. Now, if you think about it, um, there were lots of wires and these were all grounded, so it didn't get dark or anything. Um, you just drove through this little tunnel of wires. And I bet most people had absolutely no idea what this was. In 2015, the end of 2015, uh, Deutschlandfunk switched off their transmission from there and uh, there are no further transmissions from that station. So uh, the Faraday cage is gone. But if you go there, you can still drive down the A8 and you can still see the pillars and the pulleys that pulled the wires tight that were part of the Faraday cage. I found it quite interesting that when um, looking this up, um, it said uh, on Wikipedia, gosh, that's where I went, um, that uh, Deutschland Funk uh, had become defunct in 2015. Um, two different spellings there, but I guess if you know your German, you'll see the uh, mild humour in that. Anyway, I've driven through it many a time, and I did notice that fairly recently when we were back in Saarland, um, that all the cables from the cage had gone, but the cable stays still sit there as a memory of one of the biggest Faraday cages I've ever seen. So what do you think about Faraday cages? Are you going to go out and buy yourself one of these little wallets with a metalised material inside to protect your phone? Well, to be honest with you, I don't bother, but you could just double up, get yourself a nice pack of biscuits and uh, take out the biscuits, eat all of them and just use 
the wrapper that's made of a metalized foil as the protection for your mobile phone, your own personal Faraday screen. So I do hope you enjoyed that video on Faraday screens and you feel you understand them a little bit better. All I've got to do now uh, is eat some biscuits, which um, smell absolutely delicious and I do wish you could join me. But anyway, I do hope when I make my next video, you'll come and join me then.